of Bach's Magnificat in a performance by the Richard Carr Consort conducted by Philippe Pierre Lowe, one of the contenders in the Baroque vocal category for this year's Gramophone Awards. I'm James Jolly and welcome to the fourth of our awards podcasts and I'm joined by Peter Quantrill to look at things ancient and modern. Peter, a rich year for earlier repertoire? Certainly and I think that uh, the Bach disc that we've just heard, which I hope we'll come on to talk about, is an absolutely splendid demonstration of how performances of earlier music are becoming far more varied and much less doctrinaire. And if you just look at the variety of approaches in these three early music discs that we've got here, they show that no longer is this music being treated as something to be taken out of a library and handled with care. There's such freedom of approach and such joy taken in the music making. The music seems to have taken centre stage once again in the awards. It's less, it's less about the, the artists and more about the music as seen through those artists. You need- I think that's right, and I think that's also because of the way that record companies are now learning how to lead the, with this music, that it's not just driven through concerts in a way that so often the record industry and the concert industry used to be very much linked I don't think there's this perception now that one needs to feed the other. And so therefore you can have a superb disc like uh, from La Serenissima and Adrian Chandler, who are not, I think, international names in terms of the amount of concerts they give, but everyone knows them through these discs on RV. There was a time when we felt that Vivaldi and that sort of repertoire was being reclaimed by, actually just justifiably by, the Italians mm. and uh, Spanish musicians. And actually... Good old British musicians can still deliver a pretty splendid disc of Vivaldi. Yeah, I don't think, again, we need to think about national styles nearly so much anymore now because so much of the research has been done. We know it's there. We just need to get on and play the music with some style and some panache. Uh, I like the idea of this French connection, maybe a touch spurious, but if it means that we can hear this wonderful concerto, I think it's RV211 with this wonderful French overture style opening. And there's some fantastic solo work on the disc. Yes, but the bassoon playing. Yes, absolutely. Let's move on from Vivaldi for a sort of medium-sized ensemble to a slightly sort of smaller lineup. Uh, the Academy of Ancient Music under Richard Egar in Handel's Opus 2 and Opus 5. Um, they're working their way through Handel's chamber music, repertoire that probably needs to be heard more than it is. Sure. Uh, the watchword here is delicacy, I think, in those performances. Uh, you're right that the pieces possibly haven't been given the kind of airtime and seriousness that they deserve because of fitting into a set of opus numbers. Well, absolutely, and they have a kind of slightly dry title. They don't have the sort of, you know, the flashy, alluring titles that other pieces have. That's right. And um, yet, when you actually listen to the music, it's surprisingly fluid, I think, even for Handel. That movement between styles, French and Italian, with a touch of, nonetheless, the English chamber sonata behind it as well. And I think that that's what the Academy of Ancient Music bring out very much, a sense of reserve and delicacy that you, wouldn't, that you certainly don't get in other continental, more exuberant performances. It's really welcome to hear an ensemble treat the whole of Handel's opus-numbered music, because I think they've reached the end of this survey yeah, now, I think so. uh, with a unanimity of purpose and approach. It's so, real chamber music playing, isn't it? Yeah, they listen to each other.
And then the third disc in that category is, we're down to a single player, the wonderful Paolo Pandolfo, viola da gamba player. This is uh, Arbel, who we've encountered actually in the awards a couple of years ago with another disc. This is the Drexel manuscript. But P- Pandolfo has to be one of the most accomplished viola players of our time. Yes, we had Suzanne Heinrich, didn't we, on yeah. Hyperion? And now Pandolfo brings a much freer approach. Again, no sense in which this music is being... Um, taken down from a dusty library, even though that's pretty much exactly what happened. Yes. <laughs> First recordings, I think. And you can indeed hear exactly what Bach so admired in Arbel. And, uh, it's terrific freedom, and it sort of encourages freedom from the player, which yeah. I think is, is what it's all about. You know, this is not slavishly trying to reproduce what's there. You always feel with this sort of repertoire that you need to bring something to it as well. Pandolfo was taught by Jordi Saval, wasn't he? And in some ways, I think that... He is one of the most successful of Saval's pupils precisely because he doesn't actually sound a great deal like Saval. Saval is such an interesting and imaginative man. You always sense with him that he wants his pupils to pursue their own paths. And that's exactly what Pandolfo has done with all kinds of wacky projects. This is very much returning to the heartland of the solo viol repertory. Let's stick with the viol, because in the early music category, you've got two choral discs and then a disc of consort music by John Ward, played by Phantasm. I mean, I always think Phantasm have that unanimity and that... Um, it's, it's similar to hearing a great string quartet play. That's, again, because they're not, I feel, playing with a sense of homogenous style. They're actually treating every single moment and work as though it was late Beethoven which is exactly what this music deserves, had we but known it before now. I love these pieces. I'm a sucker for viol consort albums anyway. And you drew the analogy with the uh, the Beethoven late string quartets, and there's that sort of sense in a way that, you know, here are these players sitting facing each other, and they're almost doing it just for themselves. And rather like a great performance of a Beethoven string quartet, you somehow feel you're sort of eavesdropping on something very special that's going on. It's not kind of public in that same sort of way. No, indeed, it's music for ceremony and devotion, as I think one of the other awards-nominated discs was. There's a great sense of privacy about it, and the, the microphones also pick that up. You need to have a very close recording for a good viol consort recording. I very much sense that the microphone is in among them, getting down and dirty with them. And I think that this ought to really make us reappraise John Ward, who I think, by and large, we've known for his madrigals before now. Now, as I said, the other two discs in the early music category are both vocal. From AV, we've got the uh, Choir of Christchurch Cathedral, Oxford, under Stephen Darlington, a disc called More Divine Than Human, which is basically music from the Eton Choir book. I mean, a terrifically important manuscript in English music and English music making. That's right. Um, we've had a lot of discs of the Eton Choir book, perhaps few as important as this one, not just for well-known works such as the Brown Starbuck Martyr or the Cornish Salve Regina, which received several recordings before now, though again mostly it's important to note with mixed choirs rather than all-male choir, which I feel is so important in this music. But we've, then, we've not heard from the Christchurch choir that much recently, and they're still obviously in fine fettle. Well, they've had a renaissance. There were those discs on nimbus of much of the music that belongs to this kind of choir. But they were 10, 15 years ago. Then, however, Avi took a very courageous decision a year or so ago to record them in the Taverna Missa Gloria Tibi Trinitatis, the Mahler 8, if you like, of that repertoire. And I think that they proved that an all-male choir can do this music full justice. It doesn't need the smooth professionalism 
of some of the ensembles that we're used to. And indeed, there's a cutting edge to particularly the Christchurch treble sound that's so welcome in this music. I think, finally, we're hearing in recordings like this the way that the Eton Choir book shines. We're, we're hearing its special qualities in a way that very few recordings before now have brought out. <laughs> Now, the last disc in this uh, category is the 13th volume in the Cardinal Music's uh, Bird Edition, and this really is absolutely glorious. It's called In Felix Ego. Which is indeed the piece that finishes the disc, a very... And what a finish. ...fitting <laughs> conclusion. The disc deserves to have received the recognition it has done, not just on its own terms, but obviously as the conclusion to what I think is one of the most important recording projects of the last couple of decades. We ought to be thinking, I think, of Bird as one of the greatest composers, not just in England, but anywhere else of all time. And it's amazing that it's taken this long to have the body of his work available on disc from a single ensemble. This is just as exciting as when Arnoncourt and Leonhardt finished the Bach Cantatas. And there's the same sense of soaked commitment lived in purpose. You sense that Andrew Carwood has so enjoyed taking this music out of the library. And the selection here is a perfect encapsulation of Bird's genius and of the difficult and strange times in which he lived. I was reading just the other day that a couple of recusants went to the gallows singing Hague Dies in a joyful affirmation of faith that it was moving at any time. And yet, in the, on the same disc, you've got this confession of despair that is in Felix Ego, highly wrought, by which I mean cleverly wrought, but at the same time it rings out of you the most passionate emotions, I think. <laughs> 